for joining us here today for this webinar about 3D scanning in rapid form. My name is Tom Sharon, and I run marketing and product management for the rapid form group. Uh, of course, many of you are probably aware that rapid form uh, about three weeks ago, or almost uh, a month ago now, was acquired by 3D Systems. Uh, we used to be an independent company based in South Korea, and then 3D Systems, which is based in South Carolina in the U.S., acquired us, and uh, we're, we're really excited about that because it opens up a lot of new opportunities, gives us a lot more resources being part of the much larger 3D Systems organization, and lets us tie rapid form and 3D scanning much more directly to 3D printing and all of the other uh, exciting things that 3D Systems is involved with. So just to talk very quickly about the agenda that we'll go through today, uh, first thing I'm going to do is take you through uh, an overview of 3D scanning hardware. And I'm going to give you some insights on which scanner is right for you. So we're going to talk about some of the different factors in deciding what type of 3D scanner to buy. Uh, and then we'll move over and talk about the software side of things. And of course, that's where I'll introduce RapidForm to you. And then I'll go through some examples of how people are actually using RapidForm and 3D scanning today. And the other thing that I want to mention is please feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar. You'll see in the GoToWebinar interface that there is a chat and questions window. Feel free to type your questions in there. And my colleague, uh, Shane Idala is also here in the webinar with me. And uh, he'll be answering some questions through uh, typing the answers in. And at the end of the webinar, we'll also take uh, some of your questions verbally and, and um, go through that for the benefit of everyone. Now, first, I'm actually going to start with a question for you. So uh, if you give me just a second, I'm going to launch a poll. And you can now click on your screen and tell us uh, how would you classify yourself regarding 3D scanning. Are you completely new to it? Uh, have you used it just a few times before? Do you use a service bureau to scan things? Or are you already heavily involved in 3D scanning and, and you, know, you do this very frequently? OK, I think we've got most of the answers from folks in here. So I'm going to close the poll in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And I'm going to share the results here real quickly. So uh, hopefully you can see the results now. 64% of everyone on this webinar is new to 3D scanning, which is great. We're very happy to see uh, folks. And, and uh, uh, that's what this webinar is all about, is learning about 3D scanning. 21% of you have used it a couple of times in the past. 6% use the Service Bureau. And 9% of you are regular users, which is great. So thank you for that. OK, so let's go ahead and talk about 3D scanning hardware. And if we look at the 3D scanning hardware landscape, you know, this is really a, a very diverse field of all kinds of different devices. Um, and there's a lot of good options. But at the same time, there's no one size fits all when we look at 3D scanning. So there's no one scanner that will do every possible type of job um, that you can throw in front of it. However, there are scanners that have essentially sweet spots that fit um, you know, what is typically scanned by a given uh, person or company. So uh, I've broken the different types of scanners up into six categories here. And there's many ways to categorize different scanners. This is just one of them. But um, let's talk first about handheld scanners up in the, the left-hand uh, box there. So these are devices that, uh, as it says, are, are handheld. 
and you essentially wave them around the object that you want to scan. And they have different technologies to position themselves relative to the object that you're scanning. But ultimately, they all work uh, in a similar manner in that you basically pick the device up, and it's uh, connected to a laptop, and you start scanning, and then you can watch the scan showing up uh, live in front of you. Now, there are also ARM-based scanners, and these are very popular because there's a lot of portable ARMs um, out in the marketplace. A lot of people already own portable ARMs. Um, plus, those ARMs can be used for contact-based measurement, in other words, with a probe. So you can actually use both non-contact scanning uh, measurement as well as contact. And by using those two technologies together, that opens up a lot of opportunities. Uh, there and, and RapidForm can support both of those types of measurement from the scanner or from the probe. There are also area scanners. These are sort of um, point and shoot type systems where you put the object in front of the scanner and uh, you might put it on a rotary table that will automatically rotate the part around so that the scanner can take shots from multiple angles or you can just manually reposition the part and take shots from many different angles to capture the whole thing. And area scanners fall into two broad categories. One is laser-based systems that pass a laser over the object and collect the data that way. And the other are structured light scanners. And these are either um, white light scanners or blue light LED scanners. And the blue light systems have become very popular just in the last few years um, because of some of the advantages that LED offers over the um, halogen white light approach. And there are also mid and long range scanners. These are systems that can scan a room or uh, something larger like a car or an aircraft or even whole buildings. And in fact, uh, there are systems that go all the way up to uh, uh, devices that you can put on an a airplane and fly over the earth and actually get a topographic map of, of things using laser scanning. So there's a lot of different types of technologies here, very broad range. And then of course there's the consumer level types of scanning. Um, you've probably all heard about the Kinect being used as a 3D scanner because it's essentially a very rudimentary um, 3D scanner that uh, that is used to actually operate the Xbox. Um, and then many different organizations, RapidForm included, and even Microsoft, have released um, sort of hobbyist level pieces of software that will let you use a Kinect to take very, um, very rough 3D scans of things. Um, so, you know, using a Kinect as a scanner certainly isn't a professional level solution, doesn't have the accuracy that's needed for for really any kind of production application, but it's kind of a nifty tool. Um, and then there are tools like Hyper3D, which is another uh, product from 3D Systems, actually. And what that lets you do is take photos with your camera or your phone, or even video with a, with a video camera or with your phone, um, and upload those to the cloud. And then the Hyper3D system will return a mesh to you of that. And again, that's uh, essentially a consumer level type of technology that you can kind of play around with and, and have some fun with, but you know, won't make professional level results. So let's talk about which 3D scanner is right for you and the different considerations that are out there. And um, the first one to, to talk about is the size of the object that you want to scan. And every scanner has a sweet spot. Um, and if we look at sort of the spectrum of things that can be scanned, um, at one end we have things as small as a coin, you know, a dime or a quarter. Um, the 3D scanning, at least as we talk about it in, in the rapid form realm, doesn't really go much smaller than that. Um, but there are systems that can pick up, you know, all of the details on a coin. And then we move through things that might fit in a shoebox up to roughly the size of a car fender or so. And then you move into larger scale scanning technology that can scan a whole car or even a whole building. 
And of course, different types of scanners fit with each of these different sweet spots of size. And you know, when I say sweet spot, I mean the, the scanners all have a, sort of an optimal combination of speed and accuracy that fits with that type of uh, part that you're scanning. So obviously a coin, you're going to need far better accuracy on a coin that you scan for it to be useful than on a building, right? We don't care about uh, something that's, you know, a few microns in size on a building, but we do care about that on a coin. So there's lots of different technologies out there to, to address both of those issues. And let me just talk real quickly about multi-scan alignment, because every scanner can scan things larger than uh, what it can do in a single scan. And it can do that through aligning multiple scans together. And that can either be done through hardware-based alignment, like photogrammetry or laser trackers, or different types of tracking systems that actually track the object or the scanner in space. Um, and then you can move the object or the scanner relative to one another and, and scan larger objects. Um, or there are software-based alignment. You can do this inside of RapidForm where uh, you, you take multiple scans and you overlap some of that information between the scans and the software will figure out, based on the commonality of the geometry between those different scans, how to align these parts together. So it is possible to uh, scan things that are larger than what the, the field of view is of, of the scanner at one time, um, although it will add some level of inaccuracy by doing that. So speaking of accuracy, um, Scanner accuracy, of course, is, a, is another major uh, area to look at. And I've grouped here sort of the, the, the most common areas of uh, accuracy that you'll see in different scanners. So there are scanners that can get you down to about 50 microns or less, which is about two thousandths of an inch. Uh, there are scanners that can go under 100 microns in accuracy, or about four thou. Um, and then up to about 200 microns is where most of the um, smaller object size scanners top out in terms of accuracy. And then when we move up into the scanners that can scan an aircraft or a building, uh, the mid and long range scanners, we start talking about, you know, millimeters or so, uh, you know, and either a little bit below a millimeter or something above a millimeter up to three, four, five millimeters typically um, is what we'll see. And one thing to note is when you're looking at scanners and looking at their accuracy statements, uh, keep in mind that accuracy can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So uh, I recommend looking for standard accuracy tests such as VDIVDE, which is a, a German organization that has developed a specific um, protocol for testing volumetric accuracy of scanners. Uh, you also have to keep in mind that accuracy is impacted by environment and usage. So things like temperature and vibration, lighting, the surface finish of the object that you're scanning, uh, as well as who's using the scanner and have they been trained in properly using it? Has the scanner been calibrated recently? These sorts of things. These are all very, very critical questions. And so it's really important that when you're looking at different scanners that you ask um, under what conditions those accuracy tests were done. Um, and do those conditions match how you'll use the scanner, right? So just because the scanner can, can hit a certain accuracy level in a, in a clean room, in a very quiet, uh, you know, temperature controlled lab, does that mean when you take the scanner out into your uh, shop floor that it's going to perform the same way. Well, of course not. It's absolutely not going to perform the same way. So it's important to understand the context around um, the accuracy tests that are done um, by the scanner manufacturers. And of course, another important consideration is price. So if we look at the, the price of scanners, 
you know, they, they really vary quite a bit. There are systems that are under $1,000. Most of those consumer level technologies that I was talking about earlier are, um, some of them are even free. Uh, as long as you have a camera that you can use, you can upload data to the Hyper 3D service for free. Uh, the Connect obviously is, uh, what, I think $200 or something like that. Um, but those are, the, the sub thousand dollar systems are all sort of in the hobbyist um, category. Um, once you move up into a few thousand dollars, there are uh, some options there that will, will yield uh, professional level results. Um, usually the trade-off there in terms of price is um, the size of object that you can is usually pretty small um, and the uh, the time that it takes will usually be a bit longer. So as you look at the higher price systems, the twenty and forty and sixty thousand dollar systems, what that's getting you is much more accuracy uh, and uh, usually faster scanning times. Uh, and then there's other factors about portability and things like that. Um, and it's also important to mention that price and performance does not have a linear relationship. So just because something, let's say one scanner will do um, 100 microns of accuracy, the one that might do 50 microns of accuracy uh, may not be double the price, it may be five times the price. Um, and that's because, uh, you know, this isn't a linear relationship. You can't get, uh, once, especially once you start getting into more accurate systems, um, you know, that, that's costly because it takes a lot of precision um, instrumentation to manufacture those types of scanners and the, the actual components that go into the scanners get very expensive um, because they have to be precision built to achieve these very, uh, very uh, tight levels of accuracy. So I've just gone over some of these different considerations and uh, sounds kind of daunting, doesn't it? Well, I'm happy to say that we're here to help. So I want to point out that RapidForm, you know, we're a neutral software vendor. We don't sell 3D scanning hardware. Um, we don't make any 3D scanners ourselves. Uh, and, you know, for us, our motivations are pretty obvious. We want you to buy a 3D scanner because that means you're, you're going to need something like RapidForm to work with it. But we have no interest in which scanner you choose. So, um, you know, that puts us in a unique position where we're very familiar with pretty much every 3D scanner on the market. We've got customers that use essentially every scanner out there. Um, so we know them really well, but we're really not uh, married to any one system or another. So we can give very objective recommendations on what scanners make sense for a given um, application need. So um, our staff is happy to advise you on scanners and then connect you with different scanner vendors um, in your local area um, that can come in and give you a demo of the scanner and, and that sort of thing. So um, on the heels of that, I've got another poll question for you. And this is a simple one. Um, would you like Rapid Forms recommendations on uh, what 3D scanner makes sense for you. And I'll give it a few seconds for everyone to click their answer. Okay, about 75% um, of you have now uh, answered the question. So I'm going to close the poll here in five, four, three, two, one, and share the results. 72% uh, of you say yes, you'd like our recommendations, 28% say no. So thank you for that. And uh, okay, we're going to move on now and talk about software. So this is the stuff that excites me uh, for obvious reasons. And we hope that it excites you as well. So the first thing that, you know, when we, when we talk about the, the software side of the scanning equation, uh, it's really important to be goal-oriented in your thinking. 
Um, and so, and in fact, when you're looking at the entire solution of, of what scanner to buy and what software to buy to do this process, or what service bureau to use, uh, for example, if you're going to use a service company to do scanning for you, the thing is you need to begin with the end in mind. So you need to really think about what are you going to do with the data that you're getting from the 3D scanner. And some of the common things that we see are, you know, are you going to 3D print a copy of uh, an existing object, or do you intend to manufacture new versions of a part, uh, meaning mass manufacture of something, and will those be exact copies of the part that you've scanned, or do you intend to improve or modify the design before you actually uh, remanufacture a given part? Uh, maybe what you're actually looking to do is verify part quality, more of an inspection type of application or perform simulation or analysis on a part that you've scanned using CAE tools. Or maybe you just want to scan and, and archive it for the future in case the part breaks or something like that. We see customers of ours doing that with tooling, for instance, so that if tooling breaks in the future, they've got a, um, a good archive of that that they can later remanufacture if needed. And really, the answers to all of these questions define the software that you need. And so uh, at RapidForm, we've got three different products that cover uh, many of the different applications that are, that are popular um, for 3D scanning. The, the first product that you see here is RapidForm XOR. And this is our software that does scan to CAT. So you take the scan data from essentially any 3D scanner, and XOR will let you convert that into a parametric solid model inside of RapidForm. This is a true CAD model. It has a history tree. It has features. And so it's just like a CAD model that you would design in any of the major um, CAD software that's out there today. And it's really all about being able to redesign your parts so that you can make a CAD model of it and then you can actually make changes either inside of the XOR software or downstream in your CAD software. And you can also idealize the parts. And that's important because real world parts are never perfect. And scanners add a level of inaccuracy when they're capturing the data. So the question is, do you want exactly what you've scanned for good and for bad? Or do you want to idealize the part back to something that is um, more toward what would have originally been designed? And that's what RapidForm XOR is all about, is, is uh, making these um, uh, full CAD models that can be idealized and you can do design changes on. RapidForm XOS is a subset of, of XOR. So it does um, a portion of the things that XOR does. Um, and its main focus is on scan to print. So being able to scan things, clean up the data to get to a um, good watertight mesh that is printable. Um, you can also do nerve surfacing on uh, on a, a part that you've scanned. And the advantage to making nerve surfaces over a mesh is that they're lighter and can be used downstream in a lot of applications that large meshes would normally crash. Because we know that scanners create very large meshes with lots of detail. Um, and quite often, downstream software can't handle that. Uh, and then we have RapidForm XLV, which is inspection software. And this is all about doing deviation analysis, looking at the color maps that show you where uh, a part that you've scanned is in and out of tolerance compared to um, the CAD model of that part. And XOV also has very extensive tools for geometric dimensioning and tolerancing, which is uh, known as GDMT. So I've got another poll question for you now. And that is, when, when you think about your goals um, with that goal-oriented thinking, what goals do you have for 3D scanning? So just pick the one that um, most, uh, most uh, that best fits with what you're looking to do in 3D scanning. And about half of you have voted now. Okay, 75% have voted. So I'm going to close the poll here in five, four. Three, two, one.
and share the results. It's kind of kind of neat to see what everyone on this webinar is thinking, isn't it? So 68% of people are interested in the scan to CAD process. So that's the rapid form XOR software. 48% um, are interested in scan to print, which is rapid form XOS um, and also rapid form XOR can of course do that. 20% um, of you are interested in inspecting parts and 2% of you are interested in other, um, other uses for 3D scanning. So thank you there for your answers and we're going to keep moving along here. So I'm going to talk about rapid form XOR first. And um, this, this image just kind of shows how, you know, in a big picture, what is the, the XOR software all about. It's about starting with data from a 3D scanner and taking that into the rapid form XOR software and uh, taking the point cloud of the mesh that comes out of the scanner and turning that into a parametric CAD model. And the thing that I want to emphasize is that that's all done inside of the XOR software. Um, that's not how some other tools um, take the approach to making the CAD model. Other tools will have you switching between um, downstream CAD software and um, working with the scan data and kind of going back and forth between those two environments. And um, we don't think that that's the, the best way to do things. We think that having it all in one um, software environment makes a lot of sense. And so that's why XOR is actually uh, a CAD modeling system in and of itself with all of the scan data processing and mesh processing tools all put together in one application with a lot of automated tools to make the process of going from the scan data to the CAD model as easy as possible. And so once you've built the CAD model inside of RapidForm and you have your whole history tree there, you can then go out into your own software and we go directly into SolidWorks and Creo and NX and Inventor as native files. And that's really critical that we go out as native files with the history tree intact um, into those CAD systems. And then we can also write out native files to CATIA, although without a history tree, um, as well as lots of other CAM and CAE applications and, you know, really anything that you can save an IGIS or a STEP or a Parasolid file for and open that downstream um, in that software. You can export any of those formats from RapidForm. Uh, of course, you can also go directly to print. And this becomes a really interesting uh, area in that you can take a scan of a part, uh, make the CAD model inside of XOR, make design changes on that CAD model, and then print a prototype or a functional part of that modified uh, scan that you've taken, all using um, the XOR software and then going out to a, a printer. So, a couple of important things to, to mention about the method of reverse engineering that, that XOR uses. Um, it's, it's really fast. And so if we look at this impeller part that you see here, um, and we look at the, the actual time that it takes to make an accurate CAD model of that impeller, it only takes about an hour to do that in RapidForm XOR. Um, if you look at some other tools, other 3D scanning software, that talks about using uh, the scanning software and then a separate CAD application, sort of going back and forth between the two of them, it takes about six hours to do that. And the reason it takes so much longer is because flipping back and forth and trying to maintain accuracy as you're building a CAD model gets very tedious. Um, and then, of course, there's uh, just using mainstream CAD software to do the reverse engineering. And because mainstream CAD software is not built for reverse engineering, it's not built to handle scan data like XOR is, it's really cumbersome to work with scan data. And if anyone's tried that on the call here today, you know that it's really painful to work with scan data in software that's not designed to work with scan data. And that's why it can take 12 hours or even more to actually make an accurate um, CAD model of, of this example part, this impeller. Uh, but, you know, we're not the only ones who think that, that our approach is the best um, for reverse engineering. There was a study done last year 
um, by the University of Oklahoma, and it was funded by the U.S. Air Force. So we had nothing to do with this study. We didn't even know it was happening until after it was published. And obviously this was paid for by the Air Force, which has um, a lot of need for reverse engineering to keep old aircraft um, uh, in the air. And so they funded this study, and the study found that rapid form is the only viable choice for parametric solid modeling in support of 3D shape engineering and design parameterization. And, and that's, that's a long way of saying in support of the reverse engineering process. And if you want to read that full study, I encourage you to visit our website. Uh, you can see the link there at the bottom, rapidform.com slash reverse engineering study. Um, or you can go to our website and then click on the Rapid Form XOR section of the site and you'll see that uh, study is there. Um, and you can download the whole PDF and read the whole, you know, I think it's a 30-page document or so. It goes into a lot of detail. And I'm going to talk about the actual workflow inside of Rapid Form XOR uh, using one of our more famous customers. And this is Jay Leno. So uh, most of you are probably familiar with the fact that Jay Leno is a big car guy. And his garage uh, in Southern California has about 100 classic cars in it. And so he's got people that go out around the country uh, and they buy old cars that he has a team that works full time that then restores these cars. And as part of restoring cars, of course, they've got old worn out parts. And uh, for example, this 1935 Fraser Nash car, which is a little British sports car that there might have only been a few hundred of are ever made. Um, of course, it's impossible to find replacement parts for a car like that. So uh, the folks at Leno's Garage will use a 3D scanner and they'll use rapid form that they bought from us um, to take parts like this that you see here on the left that are all worn out and they'll make new parts on the right. And this process, the, the way that they did this is all of the design work was done inside of rapid form and then they 3D printed um, a waxed model of the part and then they did a sand casting to make this new part that you see here. So in the course of I think a day or a day and a half they were able to go all the way from this part that they took off of this car to this newly redesigned part that had all of the, the imperfections taken out and you know, uh, design improvements put, put in so that they could actually put this part on the car and have a working thermostat. So I'm going to talk just real quickly about the process inside of XLR. And I encourage you, if you want to see more detail about this, visit the RapidForm website. You can watch videos on there of parts being um, made into CAD models. Um, or give us a call, and we're obviously happy to do um, a more in-depth demonstration for you of the software. But we start with scanning and creating a mesh. And then the software will do automatic feature recognition. So it'll try to recognize features in the part automatically. And what that lets us do is then very quickly build up the CAD model, just as we would design a part from scratch in CAD. We take that same approach inside of the XOR software, but we have the scan data there as a template that we're building off of. So the sketches that you create, for instance, are made automatically by the software. Um, and it can do that from the scan data. And the features that you create, for instance, the depth of an extrude that you need to, to make, that will automatically be calculated by rapid form as well. And fillets that you might add, those, those fillet radii will be calculated by rapid form automatically. But the thing that I want to point out is that you're still designing a CAD model. You're actually making a new design model of a part it's just that the software is automating a lot of that process and doing a lot of the work for you. And finally, the last step is once you've made the full model inside of rapid form, you can then do what we call live transfer into downstream CAD. And that's where I was mentioning that SolidWorks, um, NX, Creo, and Inventor, we can go directly into those systems via live transfer and transfer the whole feature tree over um, into uh, those softwares so that once you're done with the live transfer process, they're fully native models, they're editable in your CAD software. It's as though it was designed 
from the beginning in that software. So you can go in and edit sketches, you can change the order of features, all sorts of different things like that. So that's about RapidForm XOR. I'm going to move on and talk uh, about RapidForm XOS. And so XOS, as I mentioned earlier, is a subset of the RapidForm XOR software that does the point cloud processing and the mesh processing and also the nerve surfacing. But it doesn't do the CAD solid modeling that XOR does. That's the difference between the two products. But again, we start with the 3D scanner, we clean up all the scan data, and then we can make an optimized mesh or nerve surfaces and go out to um, sort of non-mechanical applications where you might use Rhino or Maya for um, animation, things like that. Um, and of course, you can also 3D print the parts that come out of Rapidform XOS. So XOS has a lot of automated tools to make the um, process of, of cleaning up all the scans and putting them together very automatic. So you can see here that we have unaligned scan shots. I was mentioning earlier that some of the area scanners that you use will come in with a bunch of unaligned scans. And so the software will figure out how to align all those scans together automatically and give you what you see as the result there at the bottom. And then once you've aligned all of those scans, we have intelligent merging tools that will let you uh, merge that into a single mesh model. And then there's a whole series of tools. RapidForm is very powerful when it comes to mesh editing. <clears throat> so we can do things like global remeshing to make the quality of the mesh better. <clears throat> we can fill in holes with curvature intelligence. So if there's a hole in the data, for instance, um, we can take care of that pretty easily. Um, we can also reduce the size of the files, and that's important because scanners create a lot of data. And we can do that without losing much accuracy at all. Um, and we can also do some very sophisticated smoothing and enhancement tools. You can see in the lower right-hand corner, in one operation, we're able to smooth out the areas that are bumpy while actually increasing the, um, the, the sort of resolution around the more high feature areas like the eye uh, in this example. And beyond meshes, we can take uh, the, the, point, uh, the, the polygon mesh and turn that into nerve surface models. And we can do that in one of two ways, uh, both of them being automatic. One is we can make a what we call a feature following surface model, uh, which is what you see in the middle there. And uh, this, this model will lay out the surfaces in a way that kind of looks like a CAD model would. And of course, it's, it's not a full CAD model, it's a surface model. But this makes sense. Uh, this is a good application for when you don't actually need to modify or idealize a part. You just need an exact copy. And you want to, for instance, machine a copy of this part. And you can do that using this approach. And this approach is, um, will give you smoother, higher quality surfaces that are a little bit less accurate. You can see in this example, everything is plus or minus 100 microns. Uh, we can also get more accurate by using what we call evenly distributed auto surfacing, which is another approach to automatic surfacing inside of the software. And that one is for less um, mechanical type of objects where there is no real features to follow along to, um, more organic shapes. And this one will create more patches so it's a larger file, but it will be far more accurate. Um, you can see in this example, for this little witch toy um, that was scanned and surfaced, uh, we can get that within plus or minus six microns um, of the original scan data, which is just phenomenal. OK, and I'm going to move on to talk a little bit about RapidForm XOV, uh, our inspection software. And like XOR and XOS, you start with data from a measurement device. And XOV supports both scanners and probe devices. And you also bring in data from your CAD or CAM software so that you can compare your CAD nominal to your scan or your probe data. And so the key inside of XOV is that uh, the alignment is done very accurately. And then you generate the color maps and geometric dimensions and tolerance callouts that you need. And then you report that out through Office software like PowerPoint or PDF or Excel, 
or use our free app, free viewer application called RapidForm Explorer, which you can download from RapidForm.com, and that will actually let anyone inside, inside or outside your company open the inspection results that you make in XOV and look at them in 3D and actually do some additional measurements on them, like linear uh, measurements and surface area and, and uh, some things like that. So talking very quickly about XOV's main features, there's, of course, deviation analysis, so we can color an entire CAD model based on its uh, the deviation between it and the scan. Uh, we can look in cross-section and give deviations that way as well. We can also do silhouette deviation and boundary deviation and virtual edge deviation, lots of different deviation analysis tools that are specific to different industries. And uh, XOV is the only 3D scan software that supports every callout in the Y14.5 GD&T standard. So all of the GD&T that you see on screen here, RapidForm XOV supports these both in 3D and in 2D. So you can measure your parts just as you need to uh, based on the scan data or the probe data and using the nominal from the CAD model uh, that you import. And of course, once you've done all this, you can make reports. Um, there's also a trend analysis tool included with XOV. So you can actually look at multiple parts over time and look at statistical process control uh, uh, types of uh, information. Or there's the RapidForm Explorer free viewer application that I told you about that's available on the RapidForm website. And everything in XOV is parametric, just like in XOR. So what you're able to do is replay any inspection that you do, which makes automated inspections very, very easy. Okay, and now I'm going to go very quickly through just some different examples of parts uh, and things that have been done by RapidForm customers. So let's look here first at a few things that have been done using RapidForm XOR. So this car here, uh, this is the, I think the Subaru Impreza. Uh, we actually scanned this car, actually we didn't scan this car, the uh, customer in Australia scanned this car. And then uh, you can see the blue model there in the middle are the scans of the vehicle. So we scanned just over half of the car, because cars are of course symmetric um, on the outside. And then using uh, XOR, a complete CAD model of the exterior of the car was built. And the, the purpose for this, you know, we talked earlier about being goal oriented. The goal for uh, this whole project was um, to make a computer generated version of this car for use in TV commercials and in product brochures. And to give you an idea, it took about five days worth of work to fully scan and make the CAD model of this car. Um, which sounds like a, a fair bit of work, but I can tell you that a few years ago, this process would have taken upwards of a month or more to do this. So in just a few years, the technology has come a long way, both on the hardware and the software, to make this process a lot faster. Another car example, this uh, pickup truck. Uh, now this scan was done much faster in, in uh, just maybe, I don't know, an hour order of scanning, something like that total. So you can see it's very incomplete scan data. But it's important to point out that even with very incomplete scan data, uh, you're able to actually make a full CAD model like you see here um, using XOR because it doesn't need full scans to actually build the CAD model around it. You just need enough information that you can, can get all of the, the necessary dimensions of the object that you're making the CAD model of. Another example here is an aircraft. Same thing here, um, not a complete scan. You can see only about half the aircraft was scanned, but um, the model was made in yeah, about a day and a half's worth of work um, inside of rapid form uh, so that it could be uh, put into FEM or FEA software and do, actually probably more specifically CFD, to examine uh, how the aerodynamics would be affected by um, adding new components on the exterior of the aircraft. 
And uh, we've got an engine block here of an F1 car. And of course, 3D Systems is, a, is involved with a lot of F1 uh, racing. So uh, this is an important area for us. And you can see that uh, a scan of the uh, engine block was taken at both the block and the heads. And then full uh, CAD models of that were made inside of uh, rapid form. And uh, those took about five days to do all of the detailed work to make those. And we can scan uh, you know, non-mechanical things like uh, refineries and that sort of thing. And these can be uh, used, the scans from these refineries can be used to model pipes and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm going to keep moving fast here because we're I'm, I'm running long on time. Uh, looking at um, jet engine turbine blades, of course these can be uh, very quickly uh, made into CAD models in less than uh, half a day. Uh, iPhones and iPads, of course, as soon as these devices come out, every manufacturer of cases wants to get their hands on the data so that they can uh, very quickly design new cases and accessories for all these devices. So there's a lot of folks out there um, that you know run down to the Apple Store or wait in line at the Apple Store, and as soon as the new device is available, they rush back and scan it and use rapid form to make a CAD model of the part that they can then design their new accessories around. Uh, here's another example where there's a pre-existing CAD model of this die, the stamping die for cars. And uh, rapid form actually has tools that we call CAD Correct, where you don't need to make a whole new CAD model. You can just update an existing model to match the changes that might be present in the actual physical part. And there's another example of CAD Correct here as well. More examples of reverse engineered parts. Here are some things, uh, some plastic components. And now let's talk about um, some of the, the softer reverse engineering applications uh, that XOS can do. So artistic parts like this sculpture of a horse, um, we can take that and uh, take the scan of that which doesn't have color on it, then we can actually add color by um, taking photos of the, of the object and wrapping those on there. And then of course you can print those out with a color printer like a Z printer, for example. Um, other more um, freeform shapes like a spa or a hot tub, uh, these are great for surfacing applications that XOS can do, and XOR can also do this, of course. And other artistic things like reliefs, um, architectural features, that sort of thing. We can do all of the scan cleanup um, and mesh processing so that you can archive this or make a 3D print copy of it, things like that. We've got a lot of customers doing work in prosthetics and orthotics. Um, anything where you need to scan the human body and then design components around that, that's another major area. And now let's quickly talk about some inspection parts. So if we look at, uh, again in the automotive field, a B-pillar of a car, scan that sheet metal, and then uh, build a color map of that part, uh, and also do detailed geometric dimensioning and tolerancing on that part, all inside of Rapidform XOB. This is a pretty neat example. When uh, a car door gets stamped, there's um, deflection that occurs um, when you're stamping uh, relatively deep draw things like the, the handles. And quantifying that deflection is, is critical. So this is an example of a car company that, that scanned uh, uh, these, these door panels after they were stamped. And they wanted to actually look at exactly how much deformation was occurring around there so that they could um, update their tooling so that they avoided that problem. And you can see the color maps that come out of Rapid Form XOV um, very quickly show you where you've got uh, deformation issues and that, that allows uh, the companies to um, go in and, and know exactly where they need to make modifications to their tooling. Now we'll move on to Q&A. So, um, Shane, if you want to jump in here, if there are any questions that uh, people have typed in during the webinar, 
uh, I'm happy to answer those. Hey, Tom. Uh, there are a couple of great questions. Again. Yeah. Can you hear me, Tom? Yes. Okay. There were yep. a couple of... Go ahead. <laughs> there were a couple of great questions that were asked. Uh, going back to the scanners, one question was, are the ARM-based scanner or the ARM-based contact scanners more accurate than a handheld non-contact scanner? Uh, as a general rule, yes, they are more accurate than the handheld scanners. Um, that there, there, there are some exceptions to that, but in general, the ARM-based systems will be more accurate than the handheld systems. And the reason for that is fairly simple, that when you're tracking the, uh, the scanner using the mechanical arm, you can more accurately track that than you can using optical self-positioning um, type of tracking that are done with most of the handheld systems. Okay. Another question that was asked is uh, if you could re-explain or expand on the NURB surfaces and what they are. Sure. So, yep, yep. So NURB surfaces, um, these are, a and, and maybe a, a good way to explain this is if you're familiar with the different file types that are out there, um, a, a NURB surface is usually saved as an IGIS, IGS uh, file, whereas a polygon mesh is usually saved as an STL file or an OBJ file. Or those are the two common formats for meshes. So if you're familiar with the difference between an IGIS file and an STL file, that's the difference between a NURB surface and a polygon mesh. And really what NURB surfaces are all about are um, they're a lightweight representation of um, complex geometry and they, they do really well with very freeform contoured type of geometry and they'll be able to represent that geometry in a lighter way than a polygon mesh would be able to and so what that means is if you're taking that into a lot of different 3D um, software um, the 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 NURB surfaces via an IGIS file are generally, you know, a few megabytes and can be read by most software. Whereas a lot of the polygon meshes, the STLs that come out of scanners, are quite often many hundreds of megabytes, even up into gigabytes. And that will crash um, a lot of software. It, it doesn't phase rapid form um, because we've built it to handle very large data sets, but it, it will phase a lot of um, other 3D applications. Thanks, Tom. And then there were a couple of questions regarding training. Can you expand on the training options that are available with uh, the XOR software or with the RapidForm software? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great question. So, um, in the in in each of the regions around the world, um, we have offices. Um, in the U.S., our main office is in Denver. Um, in Europe, our main office is in Frankfurt. Uh, and in Asia, we have offices, uh, our headquarters in Seoul, in Korea, and also an office in Tokyo, Japan. And we do regular training courses at all of those offices. So um, we usually those are held monthly. Um, and training will be two to three days, depending on the, the product that, that uh, you're talking about from RapidForm. Um, and in that training, in those training sessions, uh, we go through and we do a lot of real-world examples to show, you know, exactly how you can actually make a CAD model or do an inspection or make a print-ready part. Whatever it is that you need to do, the training covers that. And we, we always keep the training classes small. We keep it under 15 people so that there's a lot of time with each of our trainers. Um, and then we can also come on site to uh, anywhere in the world, essentially. We've got engineers that um, uh, basically all they do is train on rapid forms. They're very experienced with it, and they're, they're available to travel to um, any customer location as well. Great. Thank you, Shane. And thank, thank you, everyone, for joining us here and taking the time out of your uh, busy day to learn a little bit more about rapid form. Hopefully you found this uh, educational. And I encourage everyone to go to the website, uh, we've got demo movies up there that you can watch uh, at your convenience. And you can also request a follow-up from 
uh, our engineers um, on the website. You can just fill out a form under the how to try and buy link of any of the product pages and we'll get in touch with you. So thanks again everyone and, and have a great rest of your day.